the part of the context here really is, I suppose you know that the Ateneo faculty and community you know, came out with a, with a statement against historical revisionism. Uh, it, it was a direct uh, response uh, to, uh, to a challenge. And uh, if, you, if you remember, the, the challenge was, uh, Senator Marcos said, leave it to the historians or leave it to the students of history to talk about the past. Uh, so, so, so first of all, there was a direct, uh, a direct response to that, right? in the sense that, uh, well, it's not a matter of opinion. Right? I, I sometimes I think uh, some people say it's just a matter of interpretation. You know, that when, when we came up with the statement, I think Ms. Uh, Senator Marcos replied by saying, we agree to disagree. They're entitled to that opinion. But I think what is important, first of all, is look at the historical record. I think people sometimes don't remember you know, that the martial law period is well studied. You know, if, for example, there's a claim that martial law was about peace and progress, I think you, you have to respond to that directly. You know, what kind of peace and order? What were the costs of the peace and order? Uh, and what was the... I mean, what was the effect on the economy? You know, sometimes there's an attraction to authoritarian rule. You know? For example, some people say, if we only have a different sort of dictator, we might have a different result. But I think you have to look at the record, 14 years of authoritarian rule. You know? So, what so the claim that it was about uh, promoting peace and order. I think sometimes what is forgotten is that uh, this was an effort, initially, to go beyond term limits. No? I think people forget no, that Marcus's term should have ended in 1973. Uh, so, so from 69 to 73. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a constitutional convention going on at that time. And uh, of course part of it had to do also with a, with a sense that there were problems no, in, the, in the political economy of the Philippines. But then it was, it was, it used a, a loophole in the Constitution in a context where there was really a sense also of uh, turmoil to justify the declaration of martial law. And we do know, I think students of law do know, that there has always been a question whether the, the 1973 con Constitution was, uh, was validly ratified. Right? And, and, and therefore, there, there, there is that question. Uh, even if it's justified on grounds of uh, of peace and order, it was really an effort at uh, extending personal power. So I think that's one. Uh, secondly, what were the costs of that so-called peace and order? I, I think that the record uh, does show you know, that even if you look at the, the comparing you know, to Latin American countries, you know, the extrajudicial killings you know, of 3,250 is even greater than the record in Chile under the Pinochet government, no, that's a dictatorship, but the extrajudicial killings, 77% of which were savages, was even greater. 35,000 cases of torture, 70,000 political prisoners. So, so what, were the, where were, what were the costs? No? So I think that is, that is very important to, to look at. And then also, I think we, we have to look at the, the destruction of, uh, of democracy no? for all the imperfections. So that's why I, I guess what we were saying is that you cannot just say past is past, no? as if, for example, if someone says that his role or his or her role as a political leader is simply to talk about the future and the present. No? I think that's what Mr. Marcos said, no? that it's the responsibility of the professors to think about history, but it's his responsibility to address the need for unity and the need for understanding the needs of the present. But there is a link between the two. No? Poverty was much more during the Marcos era, it was 36% when, when uh, Marcos left. Uh, in the second place, you know, don't say that poverty, you know, poverty is the same everywhere. Poverty has been here since time immemorial. I, I mean, Jesus Christ was talking about the poor, for heaven's sake. It's how we are handling the situation that is different. I, I, I am saying that at least this administration or the, the, the previous administrations before Marcos actually decided to say what the poverty level was because the poverty incidence of the Philippines was never measured officially until after until Cory Aquino came into government. Marcos was talking about poverty but there was never any effort to make an official 
poverty estimate. And so, if you said we're going to, we're going to remove poverty, what, how, what is your basis for saying what your track record is? Okay. Now, at the second, the second uh, point that I'd like to make, if I may, see, when Marcos came, he promised, or he said, you know, just give up a little bit of your freedom and I will bring this country, you know, to great heights. In other words, he said, you give up some of your freedom and I will give you a lot of bread. Well, a picture is worth a thousand words and I will tell you how much bread he left us. There was, in fact, nothing. He, he got that freedom and then he didn't, uh, he didn't bring us bread. 1960, 2009, my textbook in economic development showed the Philippines growing at a rate less than one half of what? This one, all right? Okay, so we saw what the reason was. Yeah. All right, so it's government policy and variables and institutions. Okay, who's in charge of government policy and institutions? Politicians, right? Yeah. That's why. That's why I'm going all over the place right now talking about this. Politicians, and especially the politicians who make their interests about all the other interests. Especially so that they find the, the, <laughs> the job so lucrative that they have made <laughs> a family enterprise. Right. Okay. That's the, there, there's the Marcos, there's the Pina, there's the Cayetano. There's the, I, there are 70 percent of our 2012 Congress, according to the AIM study, 70 percent of the representatives were political dynasties. Now you can understand why in 1987 when the Constitution came in and they said, well, you know, we cannot afford political dynasties. We have to democratize. They haven't up to now. They left it to Congress, isn't it? to Congress, where well, Congress hasn't done anything. For 29 years, Congress hasn't done anything. Let, let but who <laughs> votes the people in for Congress? We do. Tayo. <laughs> in other words, tayo rin. May kusalanan dyan. Governance is not a one-shot deal. You know, we thought that it was a one-shot deal. We removed the dictator, etc. No, it's a continuum. We have to continue at it all the time. And if we don't, and if we just leave it and say, we already, we already did our part, nothing's going to happen. Look at all the corruption cases all over the world. But the Philippines is highly corrupt. That is our problem. In 1968, Gunnar Mirdan wrote in Asian drama that the Philippines was maybe the only country in Asia where politic, political dishonesty is so much accepted. That was in 1968. In 2003, the World Economic Forum had an executive agreement survey. My God, the Philippines, again, was the only country in Asia among the, the countries uh, measured that was highly politically corrupt. Thailand, medium corruption. China, medium low corruption. Uh, Indonesia, medium. In other words, the corruption in our country is world class. <laughs> Benji, do you have something to say? Yeah, just wanted to add, so the, the answer to weaknesses in democracy, including corruption, is not to go back to dictatorship, but to deepen democratic institutions. So I think the, the dissatisfaction with democracy means that those of us who believe in democracy as a value should work to deepen the democratic reforms not to go back to dictatorship. Thailand uh, have the martial law for 100 years. Okay. Okay. So it was uh, recently. It's the law since uh, Lama 5, and now we are Lama 9. Okay. We are still uh, the country where we have a monarchy. Uh, it says in the law that the monarchy is under constitution. It's a con constitutional monarchy system. The martial law declare in our border provinces throughout the years, okay? It's a matter of uh, defending the country by the, the, the military. 
So the martial law is declared in Chiang Lai, in Malatua, in Sark, in many tourist destinations as well. But the military has used it very limitedly. Only at the checkpoint, only where they would, would uh, conducting some special task force in dealing with drug, in dealing with other national security issues. So the martial law is not new in Thai context, but it has been used uh, in several times, especially after the coup. The constitution was put on hold by the military in 1976 until 1983 when we returned, when we went back to democracy. During those seven years, all its constitutional rights were uh, suspended. So basically what, what we didn't have was any kind of freedom. We didn't have freedom of speech, freedom of reunion, freedom of the press. It, any individual freedom we didn't have during those seven years. During that time, what the military government did was kidnap and torture people, some people who allegedly were involved in terrorist actions. <clears throat> the thing is that uh, what was included, what is included in our constitution, fortunately back uh, in, in power now, it's the due process of law. So the main problem with the disappear was that they, had, they were not entitled to have a lawyer, they were not entitled to a just, a fair, uh, due process of law trial, and they were basically uh, kidnapped, uh, indicted, and executed in most of cases by one re regulator, which was the military junta. Uh, so what happened afterwards was that in 1983, we went back to democracy. President uh, Raul Alfonsín was elected uh, democratic president and five days after he got into power, that was in December 15, 1983, he ruled uh, the resolution which uh, made the federal courts try the members of the junta just five days after he got into power. What happened with revisionism later was that in 1990s, in late 1989, unfortunately President uh, Alfonsín's government didn't end well because even though he was like a hero for democracy and for human rights, he did miserably when it comes to economics. And Argentina during, during that period that we had like a thousand percent higher inflation rates that of course whipped off all democratic claims and whipped off with all democratic uh, demands of society because we already got what we were demanding which was the individual freedoms and going back to democratic processes. So once we got that, citizenry started to demand economic growth and economic well-being. And that, unfortunately, President Alfonsín couldn't deliver, so basically, we, in a matter of almost four, five years, we all forgot what president was given, uh, or democratic president was giving us, and we immediately kicked him off of, of government. But fortunately, we didn't use the military to do that. We learned our lessons, and what we did, we used the same democratic process. We elected another president who happily said, I'm ready, six months early, I'm ready, I can take over, and he did. And we were all very happy about it, uh, but the problem was that then this president, the next president, Carlos Menem, who was in power for 10 years, he came and said, listen, we have to let go of this, uh, disappear, military, and, and all these problems we went through. We have to let go. Why don't we give them uh, an, in, in, uh, how, how do you say, indulto? You know what indulto is? A pardon. A pardon. pardon yeah. Let's give them a pardon to the military who were indicted, who were charged, who were convicted. Let's give them a, a, a pardon and set them free because they are all coming or they are all turning into old, old guys, you know, they are getting old. So it's, it's, not, it's not necessary for us to have them in jail. And, and the people went ballistic with that, you know, say, what do you mean let them go? I mean, no, we are, we are not letting them go. But the pressures against, uh, against the political uh, parties and against the political rulers were pretty harsh still by the military, whom at the time were very strong yet.
That's something that we have to remember. We got back democracy, but the military power was still uh, big enough to put some pressure on the politicians. We've been experiencing revisionism. And the, and the problem with revisionism, in my view, is that when you go there, you lose objectivity. So basically what you are telling is that the one side of the history you are interested in uh, in broadcast, or, or which, is, which is beneficiary for you to broadcast. That is the problem with revisionism. The revisionism is never going to give you both sides of the story. You will always get one side of the story, leaving aside the other side of the story, which is exactly what happened during the Kirchner era. South Africa's experience is always seen in a very positive light. People talk about the miracle of 1994 when we transitioned to democracy and everybody remembers Nelson Mandela walking out of prison and it was this great joy. But people often don't talk about what happened afterwards because when democracy was ushered in, there were a lot of promises made. Not only were you now free, but we're going to be a prosperous nation, a rainbow nation where everybody gets along and everybody's happy. And fast forward 22 years later, and that dream has not come true. So what you have in South Africa right now in terms of revisionism is that people forget what apartheid was. So apartheid was institutionalized racism, which really was created in, in a form of white supremacy. What happened was that people forget that it was a system in place, and now it's about the personalities. So when we talk about it, we think of the bad people that did bad things, and we don't talk about the society that was created for the benefit of certain people. And so, and this really was because of the process that we had, which was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So unlike Germany and Argentina, after democracy, we did not have trials. In fact, Interestingly, uh, here we are in a university, the real way how to remember and how to overcome and how to make it uh, clear for the people started in the university. Started in the university in a movement that we call the 68 movement. Uh, because the high the climax of it was in 1968 uh, when it become, became international uh, with the Vietnam War and the Shah of uh, Persia and all of this. Uh, it started in university and was when the people born in the uh, end of the 30s, let's say the people born in the 40s, from 1940 to 1950, they suddenly got the idea, by the way, we never heard about the Nazi regime. We never heard about the Holocaust. When I went to school, uh, the, the uh, history and, and all these lessons ended with the end of World War I. We learn from history. The only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Because, yeah, sorry, if we would learn from history, all these things we are talking about, all these wars, all these dictatorships would not have happened again. Because we have that experience in the whole history. And I am very much sure that also the Nazi regime in Germany very soon will be a matter of the history books and not of the memory of that memory that is given from outside. We don't need it. What we have done is, with that revolution, that they, uh, one part of these students later said, we go the march through the institutions. That uh, means with that uh, liberal and democratic ideas, they started to go into the judiciary system. They started to go into bureaucracy and started to go into politics, to just change it from inside. Them. That is the dynasty we had, and uh, to a certain extent, uh, what our memory is, is not a building. Our memory is not a big park, like in Argentina, or what we have in Berlin, uh, in these, these Holocaust thing. No, our memory is what our foundation is doing. We believe in political education. We believe in what Theodor Hoyt said, that if someone lives in a democracy, he has to learn democracy every day. One thing I always try to remark in my classes to my students is that never forget that democracy is just a mean to a higher end. What we are trying, what we are doing in, in Latin America, especially from what I'm seeing here as well, but what we are doing is we are putting all the pressure on a system which is not 
suitable for the ends we are aiming at. Democracy is a way to access power, and it's the best way ever possible. But what's important for our societies is what do we do with the powers once we access it? I mean, governance is not a one-shot deal. You know, we thought that it was a one-shot deal. We removed the dictator, etc. No, it's a continuum. We have to continue at it all the time. And if we don't, and if we just leave it and say, we already, we already did our part, nothing's going to happen. Look at all the corruption cases all over the world. But the Philippines is highly corrupt. That is our problem.